everyone. I'm Melissa McAllister, and you're listening to The Melissa Made Show. Now, for decades, I've dedicated myself to helping women break the cycle of dieting, navigate through all the fads, and change their lives through my nutrition coaching. Now, each week, I'm going to talk about everything from deep nutrition, mindset, self-care, the ideal workout routine, tips on how and why to implement intermittent fasting in your life, my favorite recipes that are not only crowd pleasers, but they're actually healthy for you, and so much more. Now, with small and consistent changes, you can defy aging while living a happier, healthier, and more heart-filled life. I'm so excited to show you it's possible with the right strategies that are so simple to adopt. Welcome everybody to another edition of the Melissa Made Show. So I'm particularly excited about this guest and I want to explain to you how I got to her book uh, before I do the introduction. So you guys know that I am a huge veggie lover. I love vegetables. And if there's anything on this planet that I want you to eat a whole lot of, it's vegetables. And um, there's always those things that come out and I'm just going to talk about maybe like uh, what the health that came out not too long ago. And I watched it and I was like, oh, you know, at first you're like, oh, meat, ah, really? Should I be eating meat? I, you know, I've, I've eaten animal products my whole life. I love myself a good steak, but maybe it's not the best thing for my health. And so um, I started doing some research on uh, books and I was looking for people that kind of were on both ends of the spectrum that weren't just you know, advocates for one or the other, really not living the other side. And so I came across this fantastic book for those of you watching the, the YouTube video. Uh, there you go. <laughs> it is called Vegetarian Myth um, by Lear Keith. And this book was beyond eye-opening for me uh, and really made me feel good about the decisions that I make. And one of the things that I love most about her is uh, she, number one, she tells it like it is. Uh, she doesn't hold back. And number two, she is one of those people who have been on both ends of the spectrum and has insight on both sides. And so I really appreciate that. So before we get started, um, I would love to give her uh, a great introduction so you guys can see exactly why it is that I wanted to have her on the uh, podcast. So here we go. Uh, Lear Keith is an American writer. She's a radical feminist, a food activist, and environmentalist. How cool is that? She is the author of the highly acclaimed The Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustainability. She lives in Northern California, and I hope she doesn't mind that I say that she's been arrested six times. Nope. <laughs> that excites me. So um, there is uh, some, you know, acknowledgments at the beginning of the book, and there's just one I want to read. There's there's many of them. Um, it's highly acclaimed, but it says everyone who eats should read this book. <laughs> everyone who eats vegetarian should memorize it. This is the single most important book I've ever read on diet, agriculture, and ecology. And as a former and ex-vegan, that's saying a lot. So that says a lot right there. Um, but before we get started, I have seen this quote on social media probably six times in the last two or three weeks. And it is, it says, for a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food is one of the most ludicrous things I have ever heard in my life. And that's from uh, T.L. Cleave, who is a... Um, uh, a medical specialist is how they they phrased him. And so she is going to talk to us today about her journey uh, being a vegetarian for such a long time and then now uh, really standing up for, you know, eating obviously more uh, holistic diet that does include animal products. And so, uh, Miss Lear, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. It's very nice to have you on. So I wanted to start with, uh, I have a few questions here, uh, but the first one I'll talk to is about the destructive cultural nutrition myths um, that we seem to live by today, you know, that that people believe are hard facts that um, really have no backing whatsoever. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Um, <laughs> and it's very politicized. I mean, it, you know, in the 1970s, there was this big thing called the McGovern Commission, and they were trying to look into, you know, what, what was causing an increase in heart disease. And because the guy who was in charge of this was a vegetarian, um, from that point forward, everything got skewed in favor of, you know, a very ideological 
diet, which really had nothing to do with what was good for people. Um, and they were obviously going to come out saying that we all should be eating a high carb, low fat, low animal product diet. And they tried to do that. And what happened was there was such an, you know, an uproar in, in the medical community. They had to extend the hearing by eight weeks because so many doctors came forward and said, you can't run an experiment like this on the American public. We know that these are traditional foods that keep people strong and healthy. What are you doing? Um, and they didn't win, like it went down. So instead we got the food pyramid and we were all told, you know, we should be eating a tiny little bit of meat and then all these carbohydrates and everybody did it. I mean, you can look at the, you know, the sort of the charts, the graphs of what's happened to the American diet since then. Everybody did what they were told. There was this huge influx of, um, you know, cheap industrial seed oils that replaced all the traditional animal fats and everybody, did their best to eat a bunch of garbage essentially. And then everybody got sick and we wonder you know, why. I'm still shocked looking at pictures from the 60s and the 70s. And I mean, I was born in 1964, so this is my childhood. But you look at those photographs and it, everybody is so skinny. Like, I can't believe it. And I lived through it. Like I should remember this just because I was there. And it, it still is shocking to me to see photographs you know, up until about 1980 where basically everybody is thin. Um, and then it begins. And so that's what they did to us was they ran an experiment and all that happened was more diabetes, more cancer, more Alzheimer's, more everything. And I, I want to be very clear that I am not in any way blaming people for their weight issues. This is a terrible struggle that has been inflicted upon us by a whole bunch of industries that are making money off it. If they can get us to hate ourselves, you know, all the struggles that women go through with weight. And, and I know that. So I, I don't bring up this thing about weight to make anybody feel bad, you know, wherever you are in your process. I get how hard it is. Every woman in my family struggles greatly with, with weight issues. So, I mean, I've seen this, you know, up close and personal my whole life. Um, but the fact is that, you know, eating that diet will make you gain weight. Almost everybody gets fat when they eat that way. Um, and we can talk about why, we know why. It's all about insulin. And this is, you know, we know what will happen if you do this. And so that was what that was what kicked the whole thing off. And so, you know, there's been lots of competing experiments back and forth. Lots of data has been collected, but Absolutely. I ended up falling on the side ultimately of, yeah, it looks to me like cholesterol is a life affirming, affirming, affirming substance. There seems to be no evidence at all that eating it actually even affects how much is in your body. So <laughs> your liver produces like 90% of your cholesterol. It doesn't matter what you eat. Um, and also people who have slightly high cholesterol live the longest. So, I mean, all of it was a lie. And, you know, it's like this sort of snowball where you have, first you had the ideological people, which, you know, we're all somewhere. We all believe something very sure. strongly. Sure. So that's just take that for granted. Like there's going to be that, that's going to be in there somewhere. But then you have, you have to, you know, you have to take a look at who's making the most money on this. So it's not to be conspiratorial, but that's just how politics works. Right, and there are six corporations that essentially control the world food supply. They make the most money when we eat highly processed carbs because that's the cheapest food. And then they value add it by turning it into cookies and chips and whatever else. And they make the most per unit if we eat that stuff. So it's the US Department of Agriculture that put out the food pyramid. They are not charged with protecting public health. Their job is to sell commodity agriculture foods. And that's what that pyramid did. So, you know, here we are. Um, so it's been a lot of backtracking. You know, every year you'll see another cover of Newsweek. Oh, we were wrong, butter's great. Or, oh, poor eggs. Why did we tell you not to eat eggs? Like there's just this constant rollout now where they're trying to walk it back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of us have figured it out because we did it for decades and wrecked ourselves. Um, but uh, other people are still confused. And that's what's hard because the public institutions that you want to trust have given us very bad information for a long time and you know are still very conflicted themselves about what we should eat and why so it's hard to know what to believe and i understand that that is very confusing so hopefully books like mine i mean part of my goal was to ex try to explain to people who came from my ideological background that some of us already tried this and you don't need to do it because <laughs> it's not actually going to work long term you do it long enough you're going to have permanent damage um, you're not actually saving the planet. You're not saving animals. You're not saving your health. None of this turns out to be true. So maybe read a book instead of do, running the experiment on your own body because you only get one body. So I, that's for I, sure. 
yeah. And it's funny too, that you say that because, you know, I was, I just spent last weekend at Disney World and Universal Studios. And I remember being born in 1974, you know, when there was somebody that was overweight or even obese, they really stood out in a crowd. Yeah. And when you, you know, you look around today and, you know, especially with my nutrition mind, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Cause I want to help everybody. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's very difficult to find a, a, a person of healthy weight is how, how much it has flip-flopped and um, what you said about, you know, all the big food. And you notice that all of their products are the ones that have all the health claims on them. Cause it's almost like they have something to hide versus right. the actual true natural food has, you know, none of those stickers or those stamps right. or any of those things on them. Instead, it's just the actual food with no ingredient list because there doesn't need to be one. Right. So I was hoping that you could, um, share a little bit, uh, with my audience, your experience and what brought you to the point where you are today, you know, what, what you had to go through in order to, to be where you are today and to take, you know, such a, uh, you know, a stand uh, for this to help other people. Sure. So I became a vegan when I was 16 years old and I did that in the way that is most common, uh, which is that I met somebody who was a vegan and she convinced me. So I met another teenage girl who's their whole family, her whole family was vegans and she was, you know, very convincing. She had all the statistics and facts and figures and little brochures and this was long before the internet so it wasn't like I could google any of this but you know she had her spiel down because that's what her family did so uh I was you know it just took a week or two and I was like oh I'm gonna do this this, this makes total sense uh, everything that I care about is wrapped up in this issue so I, was, I couldn't stand that animals were being tortured um mm -hmm. and and I want to say that no matter what you eat I think we can all agree that factory farming is horrible and we horrible. all need to need to stop that right so yes. that just put that aside we all agree this is a horrible thing okay but you know I didn't know there was any other way so I was like oh this is horrible this is how they you know this is how we get meat this is how we get dairy I don't want any part of this these poor creatures and then you know all these myths about how much protein it takes to make a pound of beef or a pound of chicken or a pound of whatever of course none of that turns out to be true either but I didn't know that and I hadn't, I, the part of the problem was I had no counter information. And at that point, which was like, you know, 1980, it wasn't easy to find any other information. I just, I didn't even know where to look for it. So what she said made sense. I thought it was true. Um, and the few books I did find all backed this up. So it was Francis Moore LePay, Diet for a Small Planet, stuff like that. That it was like, they, you know, they laid out. I was like, well, you know, that makes sense. So I, I was full on, you know, I was like, I was 16. I was this really impassioned, um, just really very motivated young person. I was extremely concerned about the fate of the planet. Obviously I still am, yeah. but you know, at that time I just, I didn't know any better. So, and I had never seen where my food came from. I knew nothing about any of it. I lived in this, you know, very urban kind of environment and I was lucky I saw a tree, you know? So, okay, you're right. So let me become a vegan. So I did uh, just full on. I never went through the vegetarian stage. Like a lot of people are vegetarian first okay. and then they slowly, nope, I was just full on, that's it. This is the only way I've got to do this. Um, and I was like, just, I was a, just a total convert, you know, the way that converts can be incredibly obnoxious. And I'm sure that I was, especially as a teenager. Um, so I probably had some conversations that didn't go well, but you know, please forgive me out there if you were one of my victims. Um, anyway, so I did it. Uh, and within a very short period of time, I started to get like horrendous blood sugar crashes. Um, and that of course is the insulin response. Half of my family's diabetic. So like that was predictable, but I didn't know that. And I had no idea what I was experiencing. I just knew that all of a sudden I was shaking and sweating and felt like I was going to die if I didn't put food in my mouth. And that this is the problem, right? You eat some kind of sugar and let's just be frank, all carbohydrates are sugar. If it makes you feel better to call them complex carbohydrate, you are welcome to do that. But the fact is that in your intestines, every quote complex carbohydrate is broken down into simple sugars. That's what your digestion does. That's the only way it's going to get through, you know, the, the brush border into your bloodstream is if it's broken down, big chunks aren't going to get through. So it has to be turned into the smallest possible little components. And so it's simple sugar at the end of the day. So you know, what, even if it was brown rice or, you know, whole wheat, whatever, it doesn't matter. It was all sugar. So you eat a load of sugar 
And this is a biological emergency, especially for our brains. Now our brains can only function at a really, really narrow range of sugar. And this is one of these things where you can see that speaking evolutionarily, biologically, we were never meant to handle agricultural foods because it's an emergency when you eat them. It shoots your blood sugar way up and your body freaks out and says, we are going to die. Like the brain is just gonna shut down with overload. You've gotta get the sugar out of the bloodstream. So the emergency response is insulin. Your pancreas releases this flood of insulin and now that goes through your bloodstream and it grabs onto literally everything it can find and shoves it into your fat cells as far away from your blood as it can to, to preserve your brain. Well, a couple of things. One is that you now can't access it because that's what insulin's job is. So it shoved it out you know, into storage where it can't hurt you anymore, but it also means you can't get to that energy. There's, you can't get it back out. As long as there's insulin floating around like that, it's not gonna come back out. Insulin keeps it in there so that you don't die. And this is the problem for people, especially as they gain more and more weight on these diets. They're exhausted all the time. It's not that people are lazy. It's that they literally cannot access the energy that's in their bodies. It's not mm. their fault, all right? So, okay, insulin has done its job. You're not dead. Your brain is still working. But the problem is it's a really blunt instrument because when insulin does this for you, it takes everything. It's not like there's a point at which it stops doing that. It just does it because it's an emergency. So now your blood sugar is too low. So now you've got the opposite problem. And if your blood sugar is too low at the bottom of the range, you can also fall into a coma and die. So that's the moment when you start sweating and shaking and you feel like if I don't put food in my mouth, something horrible is going to happen. Well, it's true. I mean, your body is sending you that signal because in fact, you can pass out from that and you might in fact die. So that started happening to me, right? Like right away. And all of a sudden I was like, I've got to eat. I've got to eat. I had no idea what it was. I'd never experienced anything like that. Now I understand completely. I'm on that roller coaster. And the problem with these vegan diets or any of these high carb, low fat diets is that it's all you're doing all day long. You are constantly on that roller coaster where it's either too high, too low, too high, too low, insulin, 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 insulin. And it's three times a day, six times a day, eight times a day. By the time I was done, my 20 years being vegan, I had to eat every 20 minutes or I felt like I was going to die. It's just this constant grazing, you know? And there are still times in my life when I go to, you know, like full day events, conferences, workshops, whatever. And you'll see those people who are still trying to eat this diet. And it's every half an hour, they open their little snack bag and they've got to eat something. And I feel so bad for them because like, I know how horrible you feel and it's all day long. And this is the only thing that helps because you don't know better. And if I could just talk to you for like half an hour, maybe I could get you out of this because it's just going to get worse. You're wearing out your insulin receptors. You, you never meant to, to just take that load of sugar, you know, six, eight, 10 times a day. And so your insulin receptors wear out. And at that point you're full on diabetic and then you have to take the shots or the pills or whatever. And then eventually, you know, you get to be a brittle diabetic, which is what happened to my mom. So she ended up with type one and type two. So then she was really stuck taking the insulin. Um, and it's a very, very difficult life. So, you know, there it is. So that's where you're headed with these diets. And this is why these, you know, the rates of diabetes have absolutely skyrocketed in my lifetime is everybody, we did what we were told, you know, we tried these diets and, and that's where it ends. So that was the first thing that happened. And that was within a few months. I was immediately on that roller coaster and didn't understand what was what had gone so wrong. It's just like, well, this is the right way to eat. It can't be the food. Of course it was, but this is part of the problem with these, you know, really sort of ideological standpoints that we sort of wrap ourselves into um, that sort of fundamentalist mindset is like, you can't examine it, you know? And part of the problem with being a vegan is that it becomes who you are. So it's your identity. It's never just a diet, right? It's who I am. And that makes it really hard when it starts to fail or alternative information starts coming into your life through whatever you're reading or whoever you're talking to, you might suddenly realize, wow, maybe I'm not right about this. This is interesting. I just saw this documentary. You can't look at it when you're a vegan. It's such a threat to your sense of self. You're like, nope, not going to engage. So I ended up with basically a pile of books that I just refused to read because like, it's too scary. It's too threatening. And that just generally speaking, when you find yourself thinking that about any book, you're on the wrong track. Yes. Like we know that humans 
we have a tremendous capacity for that kind of fundamentalism. It's never a good place to be. If you're too scared to even read a book, you got to let something go here. It's like you, you have to keep your mind flexible. You have to keep your ideas open. If the book is wrong, you'll have arguments to refute it. If it's right, then you were wrong and you might need to adjust what you're doing, what you're thinking. What you're doing. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? My dog is barking. Yeah, they, they see something at the back of the property. So they've all run that way. Um, anyway, so that was the first part of this was, you know, I just, even as I was collapsing, I couldn't face it, right? It's like, it can't be the diet, it must be something else. So this is really common. Like everybody I know who's a recovering vegan has that same story. Like, yeah, things were getting really bad. These 10 things had gone wrong, but all I thought was, oh, it's because I ate a piece of cheese two months ago. I clearly, oh, if I'm just a stronger vegan, this will get better. Um, and that's, that's just fundamentalism, right? That's just completely yeah. theologically bound in your mind. So that happened. I stopped menstruating pretty quickly. And that's very common with women who eat low fat diets. So again, like now I know why it's not some kind of huge mystery. Uh, cholesterol is basically the mother hormone. All your hormones are made from cholesterol. So if you're not eating it, it's really hard to make enough hormones. So, I mean, we have a million different hormones, right? They do all kinds of things for us. And your body has a fallback plan, which is if you aren't gonna give me enough stuff of base material to make all the hormones that I need to make for you, oh human, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shuttle aside anything to do with reproduction because you're clearly starving and you're not getting a baby this year. So your body will just stop making sex hormones because you just, you need to stay alive moment to moment. And like when there's more food, we can talk about being a fertile person again. But until you give me some food, we're not doing it. So very, very common for, you know, women who are like very, very sort of elite level athletes where they're super thin because they're either running all the time or they're gymnasts or whatever. And a lot of them, especially the ones that started as young girls, um, you know, they have problems later in life because their puberty is delayed. Um, you know, all kinds of things happen to them that we really didn't understand until there was a generation of those, those young gymnast girls. Um, anyway, so that, is a thing that happened to me. I stopped, I just stopped menstruating. So, and nobody knew why, because yeah. doctors aren't really trained in nutrition. So I did complain about it to, to a few doctors, but they were like, well, really, we don't, we don't really understand any of these things. So if you want to go on birth control pills, that'll stabilize it. I was like, I don't really want to go on birth control pills, <laughs> but just doesn't seem like a great solution. So I just was the big mystery again, even though at that point there really were answers about that. Like they already yeah. knew that girls who, you know, basically were either too thin or didn't have enough fat in their diet. So this was, you know, a, a predictable kind of response physically. So, so that was a thing. Um, yeah. So then about two years in, um, I started to get this terrible pain in my spine. And as it turns out, um, the discs in my, the joints in my spine were degenerating. So that's permanent. I have degenerative discs at four levels of my spine and they're, it's very, my case is very severe. It's a, what they call a grade four derangement. Um, I've seen all the pictures now, the discogram, and I mean, it's, it's bad. And one of them said to me, it's kind of like a donut, except a truck ran over yours. So that's <laughs> what my disc is like. <laughs> and I laugh because what else can you do? So I'm in yeah. a lot of pain on a, just a daily, daily basis. It's the way it is. Um, I've been on all kinds of, you know, horrible pain meds and I hate them. I mean, if, I guess I'm lucky because I, I could be an opioid addict at this point. I mean, the kinds of, I've been on fentanyl, I've been on everything and I hate that stuff. I understand as a public health problem that it, it's quite large right now, but uh, not for me, I hate it. Uh, anyway, I was able to get off them when I changed my diet around, which is a good thing. Um, but uh, I will be in pain forever. This is not something that gets better. You wear out your joints wherever in your body, they don't grow back. Um, the, your joints are very poorly vascularized. So once you damage them enough, uh, they don't come back. So, I mean, I've been to a number of different doctors where, I mean, there's just sort of funny stories, but like, you know, they'll look at the, uh, they'll open the, you know, my chart up and they start reading it and they're like, oh, were you in some kind of like massive car accident? Like what happened to you? I was like, well, it's the nutritional equivalent. I it was not a skydiving accident. And I did not fall off a roof, but yeah, that's what I did. So 20 years ago, I didn't get better. Um, so that wasn't any fun. Um, and then I also ended up with Hashimoto's. So that's an autoimmune disease of the thyroid. And that's you know, pretty common for women. Um, you will note that Hashimoto's is a Japanese name. Uh, the, 
thyroid problems are super high in Japan. And the reason is because of the soy in the, in the diets. Um, so yeah, the, you're a vegan, what are you gonna eat? It's a lot of soy, so I killed my thyroid. Um, and then once you have one autoimmune disease, you're 40% likely to get more. So I now have three. <laughs> Some of them are very, the Hashimoto's is actually very well controlled. Um, going gluten-free was huge. And I recommend that for anybody who has autoimmune diseases, gluten is just, it's a killer, honestly. I was like, this is just right. not human food. And we can talk about why if you want, but it's molecular mimicry and the plant lectins. They're, these things trigger your immune system, confuses it completely. What is me? What is not me? It's because the proteins in gluten look very much like uh, the proteins in your tissues. So in my case, it looks very much you know, like the thyroid and my immune system went, well, we don't know what is me, what is not me? And it just starts attacking you know, parts of your thyroid. So that, that, that started when I was, yeah. So that's what happened there. Um, but now I've got more. So it, and some of them are hard. I mean, some of this stuff is like, it's hard to push back once you've got it, you better off not ever getting it. Yeah. So that, that's no fun either. So there's that one. Um, <laughs> some of this, I have, oh, another one is gastroparesis. So this goes back to that, um, the insulin little roller coaster problem. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, um, when you're at the very bottom of your blood sugar and you've, you know, you've got that kind of emergency, right? And then you eat some more food. So you start the whole thing all over again. Uh, one of the ways that you're, one of the responses when you have that flood of insulin is also adrenaline, which is kind of interesting. But if you think about it, what adrenaline does is it sends energy to the muscles. And so this is another way that your body is saying, freaking out on this load of sugar how do we get rid of it how do we need to get it out of the blood as fast as we can well we can send some into the muscles so here's a shot of adrenaline and that should do it now if you're being chased by a tiger adrenaline is a great thing you're going to need that energy in your muscles because you're either running or you're fighting for your life okay. sure once every six months you might have that experience in the wild so yay adrenaline what you don't want is to have that experience six times a day because of course you're gonna wear out your adrenal glands, you're gonna end up not being able to produce any, but under the influence of adrenaline, and this stuff is really interesting to me. I don't know if people are bored at this point, but no, one of I'm the things, it. other things that adrenaline does is it suppresses momentarily um, your stomach's, um, your whole digestive system shuts down. And this is because your body thinks it's having an emergency. Here comes the lion, here comes the tiger. Um, you don't want any energy happening in your digestive tract. You don't need it right then. What you need is your muscles ready to, to, to fight or flight, right? That whole thing. So to suppress your capacity to digest, it means all your digestive enzymes and processes are shut down. And that's what I did. I destroyed my body's capacity to make uh, hydrochloric acid because I was on that roller coaster so many times. So the people who tend to get gastroparesis are diabetics and it's the exact same process. Um, and I'm not an out and out diabetic, but I was certainly headed down that path. So every day I have to take this stuff called betaine hydrochloride, uh, but it was a miracle because I honestly felt sick to my stomach. I'd say 15 years straight, it just never ended. Um, and nobody could tell me why. And it wasn't until after I'd gotten out of vegan world and sort of found all these other sorts of doctors and practitioners who helped people like me um, I mean, I was diagnosed over the internet, just on like a, a group chat where this guy who's a doctor, was, I was complaining and you know, we all were, we were all recovering vegans of one kind or another. So people were putting, oh, I've got this problem, I've got that. And I was like, I'm just going to mention my stomach because I'm so tired of feeling nauseated. So I typed in, I was like, I got this, man, I always feel sick no matter what, unless I don't eat for 24 hours. It's like a lead ball in my stomach. And this guy was so nice. He just wrote to me. He's like, you're that one that was the vegan for 20 years, right? I'm like, yeah, that was me. He's like, I can tell you what you did. Go to the store, get this stuff. It's called betaine hydrochloride. Take four with every meal. Talk to me in two weeks. I was like, free advice. Why not? And it was a miracle. He was so nice. But yeah. anyway, I've been able to help people with that too. I'm like, I can tell you what you did. You suppressed your body's capacity to make hydrochloric acid. It's over the counter. It costs $15. You might as well try it before you swallow the, you know, the radioactive, whatever barium, and they do that whole workup. You don't need to do that. Try this first. It'll probably work. If you did one of these diets long enough, that's where you're at. So anyway, it worked. So I don't really have that anymore as a real issue. Um, but I still can't really eat at night because at that point it just, it's still shut down too far. So I, I pretty much stop eating at like three o'clock and then I'm okay. So there was that one. And then there's a bunch of smaller ones. Like, you know, my skin was so dry, it hurt mm. and it, really hurt especially in the winter like I just it just hurt 
because it couldn't move. Like there was no elasticity to it. And when I was getting out of vegan world, the first thing, the first animal product that I reintroduced was eggs because it felt like, I don't know, sort of the best one. Like, oh, hens just lay eggs anyway, as long as they have good lives. Like, all right, you know, That's it's kind it. of a byproduct of chicken. So let's just, I'm just gonna eat eggs. So that was where I started when I, you know, was sort of reintroducing some of this. Four days into eating eggs again, I woke up a completely different skin, completely different. Like I could move my arms and legs and it didn't hurt. I just thought, what have I been doing to myself? Like, why did I live with all that pain? It, it was amazing. And also my complexion looked completely different. I kept running to the mirror, like, I look like a, like a live person here. Like I was so ghoulish with that sort of gray pallor they all get. And I didn't even realize until I looked like, wow, a rosy young person who might mate, you know, it's like, I look so nice now. And it was just, I looked terrible before. Um, yeah, so the eggs were fantastic. And that is still a true thing. Like I have to eat two eggs a day or my skin starts to feel that sort of itchy dry, like the pain is coming on feeling. Um, yeah, there's specific stuff in eggs, in fact, that, that is very good for skin. And I, I'm one of those mm. people who just, I really need it. So luckily I live, you know, I've had chickens. I live in a rural area. It's so easy to get good eggs. Um, the hens have the absolutely wonderful lives and that, you know, they're building topsoil and it's all organic and like everything's really nice. So I'm very, very content with my egg supply. Um, I think that pretty much covers the main, the main things, but you know, one thing I want to say to whoever's listening is if you're trying one of these kinds of diets and it's not working for you, it's better to just face that because some of these problems will be permanent. You do this long enough, there's no coming back and you'll probably feel better pretty quickly. So it is worth trying. That was the thing, like on my very first day when it was finally, I had to face it. I was like, I'm gonna try it. I gotta try this. And I thought, well, it goes one of two ways. Either I feel better right away and as hard as that is, I will feel better. So that's a net positive or it doesn't work. And then I can say, ha ha, I tried it <laughs> and I don't feel any different so I can keep being a vegan. So it was like, all right, either way, you're, it's a win-win, so just, try it and what i ate first was tuna fish it was an utter miracle and there was no looking back but the point is if you do this long enough if you stay in that denial you're gonna do permanent things to yourself i mean i will always have morphine level pain in my spine there's no getting that back so please learn from my life you, you don't have to run the experiment on yourself if i can share two stories with you uh leah really quick the first was my daughter who um was vegan. Uh, it was, I believe when she went to college. So she was, she was a very young adult um, and she did it for, you know, ethical reasons and sure. was vegan for, for quite a while. Uh, ate, ate a lot of fruit. She's a big fruit lover and ate a lot of fruit. And I was at the time pretty much, I would say paleo-esque, you know, mm -hmm. maybe sure. a little bit starting to get a little bit on the, the higher fat uh, bandwagon, but very paleo-esque. And we went in together to get our blood work done. And she was so excited to show me how much healthier mm. her diet was than mine because you know she was eating vegan. Right. And we went in and she went first and you know they took our blood work and she immediately got her tri triglycerides back and they were over 600. And oh. the nurse, yeah, the nurse thought, this is a teenage girl, the nurse thought the machine was broken. So she did her that blood work again. Yeah, yeah. And it was at 585. Oh. And yeah, that mine was are like 72 every time I yeah, go in. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Right. That was that was an uh, that was a wake-up call for her. You oh know, my, thank goodness. Your heart must have just dropped into oh, your absolutely. stomach her mother. Oh my goodness. I have to be honest, there was that that little tiny second of ha. I'm right. You're I wrong. was right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and my triglycerides were incredibly low. And so, but that was, you know, kind of what it took for her to understand that she was kind of harming her. And, and I, I hold on my vegans and vegetarians out there. Um, the second story is, I hope they don't mind sharing. I have two really close friends. Uh, they're named Darren and Danielle, and they went vegan for two years. And he is the smartest man on the planet, the most well-researched human being <laughs> ever. And they were vegan for two years and they did it perfectly. If there's a perfect way to be vegan, they did it perfectly. 
and about, I could be off on my dates, but about six months ago, they finally announced that they, they were going back to eating meat because they were having health problems, which yeah. shocked, shocked the shit out of me because the, if they were always my example to people, I'm like, I'm, I, I don't, you know, I think animal protein is incredibly important to our health, but I do know people who live, you know, vegan and are very healthy. And then to hear that, I was like, oh, and now they're very, um, very much not vegan anymore. Um, my question for you, yeah, and it's just gonna have to be your opinion, but do you think that you can live, you know, vegan and or vegetarian, because those are very different diets, but that you can live either one of those um, optimally? No, I mean, you're gonna last longer as a vegetarian because at least you've got eggs and dairy, but as a vegan, it's out of the question. The problem is, there's two problems. You have the problems of excess, and the problems of deficiency. So the problems of excess are number one, the sugar. Um, any of these diets where it's you know beans and, and grains and it's just nothing but carbohydrate and the human body just isn't meant for it. So you're gonna be on that roller coaster. You're gonna to have too much insulin. You're gonna wear out your insulin receptors. It's gonna be nothing but constant inflammation from all that, all that insulin. Um, you're gonna wreck your blood vessels. Like there's just no way around it. So that's problem number one. And then there's other problems, like there's the excess of omega-6s. So you need both omega-3s and omega-6s, but the problem is we need to eat them in the correct balance. Um, we do not have, the, our bodies do not have the capacity to pick the ones we want and reject the ones we don't need anymore. We have to eat them in the perfect balance. And because the, the enzymes that we make to do, there's long strings of conversions that happen there and we just don't make them. So it, it you have to eat them the way that your body needs them. And honestly, the perfect food, what do you know is grass-fed beef. Um, we evolved on that African savanna hunting those giant herds of animals. And so, I mean, that just makes sense. That's who we are. And our bodies are made to accept that food and not much else diversions from that. That's what we need. And that has the perfect omega-3, omega-6 balance. Um, not much else does. Some seafood does, absolutely. Um, but there's not much else that does in the world. So, and, and there's no way that grains do because they basically don't have omega-3s in them at all. So it's entirely omega-6s. And even if you're eating meat, but it's factory farmed meat, you're gonna have the same problem. Uh, within two or three days of eating corn, which is what they give these poor cows in factory farms, um, all of the omega-6s are gone, or omega-3s are gone from those cows' bodies. They go back to just having the same problem that we have when we eat grain. So a diet of factory farm meat is gonna end up with the same problems where it's just this huge overload of omega-6s and, and no omega-3s. There are people in the United States when they test their bodies, there are literally no, not a single trace of omega-3s in there because all they're eating is potato chips, bread, and then crappy meat from, you know, cheap stuff from Walmart or whatever that's all factory fed. There's not, they don't come into contact with any omega-3s. So the problem with omega-6s is, is it's all inflammation. And you know, a high load of omega-6s are over implicated in everything from diabetes to Alzheimer's to autoimmune diseases to depression because they create, create inflammation all over the body. Now you need some inflammation because your body has to be able to have a healing response. We need to be able to break down cells that we don't need anymore, dead tissues, all of that, we need it. Um, but it has to be in balance because the omega-3s calm inflammation. You don't need too much. You just, it's Goldilocks, you need just right. Um, and eating foods like grass-fed beef will give you that exact, you know, the exact right balance. But eating a vegetarian or vegan diet, you're never going to get the right balance because these plant plant foods simply don't have any omega omega threes in them, or hardly any. I mean, the best thing is like walnuts, and it's still like I don't know, twenty to one or something, omega sixes to omega threes, which is just still, you know, by a factor of twenty, way too high. This is way too high. So no matter what you do, you're going to end up with this. Um, and then some other deficiencies. I mean, there's just no way to get enough protein. You're going to get proteins that aren't complete. complete and yeah. back in the day, you know, when I read Francis Moore LePay, the idea was you could combine them, that, you know, your body would, if you gave it some rice and some beans, uh, you know, you would, you could shuffle around all the amino acids enough that you'd get a complete protein. And it's not true. Um, now that they can actually tag the food as it's traveling through you and watch them, uh, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, it turns out that they actually don't break down into just, just amino acids. They come in kind of smaller chunks. So your body can't really break them down and then recombine them. So the whole thing was kind of a, I mean, it was a beautiful dream, but it's not true. So you can't, and that's why plant proteins are called poor quality. It, they also come wrapped in um, cellulose, all of them. 
that's what plants are. That's what they do. That's what their bodies are made out of. We don't have a good mechanism to, di to digest cellulose. That's what ruminants do beautifully. That's what cows do. It's what bison do. They have a four chambered stomach that's neutral pH and is filled with bacteria that does the work for them. We have a completely different kind of digestion. It's acid, highly acid. And we break down protein with it. That's what we do. We have no way to access what's inside that cellulose. Right. So you can eat as much as you want, but you're not going to get much out of it. And it's not going to be in the right proportions. So mm -hmm. it's poor quality. So you're, you're going to have these sort of deficiencies of that. And then there's a lot of nutrients that are only available in animal fats. And these are the, you know, the, the most dense animal foods um, are going to give you those. So things like liver which we don't tend to eat anymore in the United States. And it's, it's a terrible tragedy. These are like the best foods. Um, but yeah, so vitamin A, vitamin D, um, K2 is a little bit available in plants, but really the best is animal products. You can't get these any other way. You can't get vitamin D from anything, but an animal, you can't get vitamin A. You can get what's called proto-vitamin A, um, it's a precursor to the actual vitamin A that we need, but then your body has to convert it. And humans are very bad at converting it, especially the very young and the very old. You have to eat like, you know, eight times the amount just to do some of those conversions. And there are people who literally do not have the enzyme to do the conversion. Their genetic, um, you know, their background, it got pruned from the evolutionary tree. And this is mostly people who, you know, lived or, or your ancestors lived on islands or on, on coast coastlines where they were eating so much seafood, they didn't need to do the conversion anymore. And that's what evolution does. Like, we don't need this, don't bother with it, off it comes. And these people are obligate carnivores, just like a cat is. Um, and a lot of the people who get really sick on vegan diets, that's exactly what's going on is they, there's no vitamin A in the diet and they can't do the conversion from carrots to actually what the human body needs. Right. So that's a real issue. Um, B12, that, I mean, just, you're done. Like you have to have B12. And I um, I was smart enough that I actually took supplements, but it always stuck in my craw that I had to. I was like, there's gotta be a way around this. This has to be the natural diet. Where did people get their B12 back in you know, the garden of Eden when we did not eat meat? Where did we get it? Um, and it's just, you know, it's a myth. Like you have to have it and right. you can't get it any other way. Mm -hmm. And I, one time I got this really beautiful letter from a, he's a neurologist in Germany. And it, you know, he just had this gorgeous, uh, very formal English, you know, and anyway, he wrote me this beautiful letter and he said, you know, every week, not every day, but every week I see one of these people, they've been vegan for a decade. They have done permanent damage to either their eyes or their hearing, and they will not listen to me. They're going to go blind or deaf if they keep up with this and they will not listen to me. And now I can give them your book. And I was like, oh, I'm like, that just doesn't right. Aren't you just so like, I was just so happy in that moment. Like, well, if I can do something for these people, because this is my tribe, like that was me. You know, I could have done that. I wrecked my spine. I didn't wreck my eyes, but I could have, you know, so if I can reach those people and pull them out before it's too late, then it wasn't all for nothing. But anyway, yeah, B12, it's right there. So, yeah. um, and then there's other things. I mean, you need cholesterol, you need fat. Um, you can get some of that on a vegetarian diet, but eventually you still have those other problems. It's, you know, the excess and the deficiency, it's all there. So it, you'll last longer being a vegetarian, but at the end of the day, and there's things that you just have to get from meat, you know, like taurine, it's in there, carnitine, like there's amino acids that are just, we do really need, you know, it's like, oh, well, maybe we can put them together. I mean, you can try, but you're going to get more and more exhausted. Co CoQ10 is another one. Um, and there's an iron, especially for women, it's really hard to get. Um, and it's heme iron, especially. It's, you can get other kinds of iron from other kinds of places like spinach or whatever, but the plant irons are not heme iron and your red blood cells, you know, the red blood cell is a, a miracle, honestly. Like the more you look at, read about what it is and how it works, like, how did evolution do this stuff? Like, it's so fascinating. The very center, center of your red blood cell is a molecule of iron, but it's, it's specifically heme iron. If you get the other kind of iron, your body will try to make it work, but it just doesn't. And what that means, I mean, it does its best, but it just, it doesn't fill the same role. And what that iron does is as your blood is circulating, it, it's, that's what's exactly responsible for picking up oxygen in the lungs and then it carries it and then it releases it into your cells. So you literally have energy to burn. And that's what the heme iron does. It picks it up and then it lets it go. And it can't do it properly if 
you don't have the right kind of iron and you can only get heme iron from animal products, especially from, from land mammals. So uh, I'm sorry, vegetarians. I know you really want, I know with all your hearts, you, you need this to be true. It's, it's very, very hard to come to grips with, with what I'm saying. I'm, I know this is not easy. I want, you know, when I saw that my girlfriend had finally gone on to her social media and, and it announced that they had pulled back from being vegan, I messaged her and I said, okay, what's the first thing she, you ate? And she said, um, grass-fed steak. And she said oh, it yeah. was the most, <laughs> she said it was the most orgasmic yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> moment. The meat I they call swear. It the meat yeah. Yes. Yeah. My neighbors must have thought that we Her were just having crazy sex. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I mean, I, I have that feeling when I, you know, when I, I eat steak, you know, at least once a week. So I, I can't imagine waiting two years to have that, that, that wonderful piece of steak. But yeah. so can you, can you share really fast with um, the audience kind of how to, uh, you kind of did a little bit, but it, not that you have a secret, but something that you've seen that has been really helpful with the people that you've been able to reach their mindset you know, of getting out of, especially yeah. veganism, especially if it happens to be for uh, ethical reasons, more than for diet reasons, uh, how you help that mindset. You know, it's a long conversation and I can do it, but you need to give me like an hour or two. And then usually <laughs> I can talk them around. Um, yeah. The problem is we don't understand the nature of nature and then the nature of agriculture, because the nature of nature is perennial polycultures integrated with an animal cohort. And that's literally what living communities are. Yeah. The problem is when you do agriculture, all of that life is removed from the land. Every last living creature, and I mean down to the bacteria, gone, cleared off. And then you take that land and you plant it just for humans. And what you're planting is one annual crop. So it's wheat or soy or corn or whatever. Um, it only lives a very short time. That's why it's called an annual, which means it doesn't have time to develop a deep root system. Now, all of this matters. Um, when you have that perennial polyculture, which is what nature builds, you got lots of different kinds of plants. They are all working together. And their main goal is honestly to build more topsoil because that's what they live on. <laughs> so they have to protect it and they have to build it. And the way that plants do that is they work in concert with all kinds of microorganisms, especially things like bacteria. We've got the mycorrhiza under the surface of the soil, which is this incredible neural network where they all communicate with each other. They're constantly talking to each other, sending each other help, sending each other messages, sending each other nutrients. No plant stands alone. Like they're all in this together. Uh, and the, the relationships there are so complicated. I, there's no way the human brain could ever really understand them. But regardless, um, the deep roots, whether it's trees, whether it's prairie grasses, very, very deep roots. And what that means is when it rains, the water physically has channels to enter the soil. The moment that you clear off that life, if you just go and look at a bare spot of land, the next time it rains, you will just see it all puddles, pools on the surface of the soil, and it's destroying it. Like literally just the pounding of the rain destroys the soil. Um, and any little slope means that off all of that soil goes and all of that mud, all that silt goes into the nearest waterway. So now you've killed the local river too, which means there's no fish. They can't live in that kind of water. They need clean water. They need to be able to breathe just like me and you, and they can't. We've killed all the rivers by doing agriculture. So um, you have to put the life back on the land to do all that, right? So bit by bit, every time, every year that you're doing agriculture, you're destroying the soil itself. And soil is the basis of life, land life anyway. We owe our entire existence to six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. Um, so this is biotic cleansing. It's a nice way of saying mass extinction. All of those animals had nowhere to go. There were once 60 million bison on this continent. They're gone. Why are they gone? Because we wanted to grow wheat and rice and soy and whatever else. So they're gone. They have, there's, there's no room for them. We took it all. Um, and you know, there's 10 million mule deer and there were 5 million uh, mountain sheep and there were 5 billion prairie dogs. I just want people to imagine like how much life there was on the Great Plains before all of this happened because it's really extraordinary. And there are historic recountings. There's, you know, journal entries of people. You could sit on a rock for four days and watch a single herd of bison running by. It took four days for one herd to do that. There were prairie dog colonies that were a hundred miles long in Texas, a hundred miles of prairie dogs. Oh, and the other thing about prairie dogs is that they actually work as aquifers, they're burrows, they, all this water is stored. 
um, because of the action of prairie dogs. So all of this is gone. The plants are gone, the animals are gone. It 98% of the world's old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies have been destroyed and they've been destroyed for agriculture. They've been destroyed because humans wanted these basically six foods. Um, you can't tell me that destroying 98% of habitat for animals is any kind of goodness toward animals. They've got nowhere to go. 200 species go extinct every single day. And at bottom, this is why, is because humans took up this one particular activity, which completely changed the way that we live too, but it meant we had to take over the land. It's the longest war ever. And nature is fighting and fighting and fighting to get her land back. And every time we plow, we're pushing her off again. And it means all those plants, all those animals have got nowhere to go. So we're not actually saving animals by doing this. We're permanently extirpating all of them and some of them into extinction forever. So it's not actually good for animals. And that is a hard thing to come to terms with. We've been doing agriculture for 10,000 years, some of us. I mean, there's still, I think what, uh, 48 tribes left of, of actual hunter gatherers. So except for them, <laughs> the rest of us were converted by force. Agriculture always spread by force and genocide. Um, but now here we are and we don't question it because it's just the way that we've been doing things for so long. So it seems like it's this you know, wonderful peaceful activity because you look at your plate and you think, oh, is there a dead creature on my plant plate? And what you see is kale and rice. And you're like, oh, thank God, no animals died. It looks that way, but entire ecosystems died for you to get that food. They're gone, the bison are gone so that you could have that food. Beyond that, um, there's all the animals that are died in the making of the food. There aren't a lot of animals that can, that can live inside that kind of monocrop you know, horror scene that we have created across the Midwest. But there are some, there's ground dwelling birds. And of course there's a lot of little rodents and there's some um, reptiles as well. So there's snakes and whatnot. And it's the, the statistics that I read is for every acre that you harvest wheat or whatever, every acre it's, it could be at least a thousand animals are killed in the, the, just the harvesting. If you think about those giant, you know, the, that equipment that rolls across mm -hmm. the land. And I've, talk to people who've actually either owned or worked on those farms and they say, yeah, it's true. And the very last acre that you harvest is hell because it's nothing but dead animals. And it's really, really horrifying to watch because it's just bird after mouse after snake, just their bodies just absolutely flattened, you know, coming out the back. It's just like this bloodbath mm -hmm. and they hate it. It's a horrible thing to witness. And that's what goes into your wheat and your soy and your corn. So it's just on every level, you're not saving animals. I know you want this beautiful, peaceful plate. I know. I wanted my life to be possible without death. The problem is no matter what you eat, there are dead animals involved. And the only choice we have, death free is not an option that life gives us. There is no creature that exists without something dying. So the only options we have are, is this the death that's killing the planet? And that's agriculture or is this the death that's the part of the cycle of life that is making that cycle stronger? So is your food based on repairing those ecosystems? Is it based on bringing back perennial polycultures with an animal cohort? Are you repairing topsoil? Are you, you know, recharging the water table? Are you protecting the local waterways? Are you making a home for the ground dwelling birds and you know, the migratory birds and the mammals from tiny to huge, like everybody can live there if you have a grass-based farm. You know, they can all just wander across, they can eat what they need, they can move on. Um, and you can't do that with agriculture. It's like I said, it's a war and they, they can't, most animals can't live in that, in that situation. They need to eat very specific foods. They need very specific temperatures. They need, you know, very specific kinds of grasses. Um, they need trees if they're, you know, forest dwelling creatures. It's like, we've got to let the earth come back. We have to let life return and it's the only hope that we've got. So you can participate in that. And there is a sad moment, you know, every single day when I have to remember that, like it's something's gonna die to feed me today. But that is the adult knowledge that we have to face so that we can do it well. And I'm not saying it's an easy moment. And most of us don't live in cultures that, that know that and that, that honor it, you know, and that, to me, that was like one thing that really helped. And I know this sounds like the worst cliche in the world, but I had a friend who was Native American and she just, uh, you know, she just looked at me like with such like, honestly, pity in her eyes. Like, how do you not know this? I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm so stupid, but I'm still really upset that animals are dying. And she just looks at me and she's like, we are for something to live. Something else has to die. 
that is just what it is out there. So you say, thank you. That's all you can do is just learn to say, thank you. You'll be all right. But it was like, God, you should have known this by the time you were four. Like, what is wrong with you people? I was like, I know, I know, I get it. All right. Um, but you know, she was given that by her grandma and I wasn't, I had wonderful grandmothers. I don't mean to throw shade on my grandmas. They were wonderful people, but you know, long since agricultural people and like nobody, we don't remember any of this. We don't know. So it was just incredibly, it really, really helped me to get over that hump because it was still so hard to think about animals dying. And it, she was right. And having tried to grow my own food, I came up against this right away. I had to kill so many things just to have a garden. And it was horrible as a vegan. It was horrible. And it was one of the reasons that I got chickens and ducks was like, I don't even need to eat the chickens or ducks. I don't care. They're going to eat the bugs. And then I won't have to, I won't have to kill a single animal. They're going to do it. And they did. They did a beautiful job, but I'm fooling myself here. Come on. The bugs have to die for me to live and they're animals and they have cute little faces. If you look closely enough and watching the ants protect their babies near killed me. All I did was pick up a rock in my garden and there's like a hundred ants panicking because there's all their little, you know, their little nests, the little nurse cells and all the ants underneath that rock grabbed a baby and ran as fast as they could for the shade. Like it's what you would do in a burning building. You'd grab the babies out of the, you know, out of the daycare center. Of course you would. And that's what they did. And I was like, they're no different than me. They're tiny, but come on, like we're all in this together. And it was really hard. So yeah, something has to, but you have to face it. This is the basic algebra of existence. If you're alive, it's because something else died. But remember your day's gonna come. And one day you're gonna be the grasses. Every molecule in here is gonna get eaten. It just is, you know? And then you'll be a bison or you'll be a baby hawk or, you know, the baby foxes. I have mountain lions on my land. So it's like, I'm so for it. Like, please, somebody just eat me. Just take it and feed the, you know, the kits, feed the little baby mountain lions. I would be so happy if I got eaten by a mountain lion. I just would. It would be so cool. Like, I'm probably not going to get, that's not how I'm going to go. I'm sure I'm just going to die. Time. <laughs> have to bury me and all that. Like, I get it. But it would be so much yeah. nicer just to get eaten, you know, and just know that very directly there was some hungry mother got to, you know, lactate me into her babies would just be like, just keep that flow moving, please. I want the mountain lions to survive. It's just they're, oh, they're yeah. hanging on by their fingernails, you know, the apex predators are having the hardest time. So that's it. So that's it. That's, that's my spiel. So sometimes, you know, I'm able to convince them if their health is really already failing and they're like just this close, if I can help them over that lump of like, your food is not actually saving animals. It's in fact, the worst thing humans have ever done. There is food you can eat that does actually save animals. It means killing some of them sometimes, but life itself gets to continue. If I can walk them through that, it's like, I'll hear from them in two days. I ate a steak. I feel so much better. Thank you so much. I'm like, all right, we did it. Um, other times it takes longer. I never hear back who knows. And, you know, so, and other times it's like five years and I'll be like, I need to tell you that conversation really helped. I read the five books you told me about. I did finally get out of this and I feel so much better and thank you. So, you know, we do what we can. Um, more important is that I think that there's a movement now because when I was a teenager and I stumbled into veganism, there was nothing to tell me what was the problem here. And now you can find all kinds of books, all kinds of demonstration projects. You can learn. I mean, there's so much good information out there about how we're going to sequester the carbon. Like this really is the way forward and there's great stuff. So if you have any questions, like it's already been answered. You just have to be willing to engage with the information and, and you'll find out that what we're saying is, is it's true. So can I ask you, um, generally speaking, what does a yeah. day in the life of eating <laughs> for you look like now? After well, I have to be low carb no matter what, like that's just yeah. my insulin receptors are done. So that it's never going to be on my plate to eat anything but that. Um, it doesn't mean I don't have a treat now and then on my birthday, but I have to be really, really careful. I can't do it more than one day every so often. I just feel so sick. So that that's a done deal. Um, some people do get insulin receptors that, that come back a bit. Like you can kind of resensitize them. Good on you if that's you, but it, it, for me, it's just, it's just over. So I did it too long. Um, but I basically eat a paleo diet. You know, it's a, it's meat and it's really good eggs. And I'm very lucky because I live in a town that has a cheese factory, which is like how many people get to say that? And they're really committed to local grass-fed cows. Oh, nice. So for the cheapest amount of money, I can get some of the best cheese ever. And our little cheese factory 
I mean, I'm just proud of this because there's not much in my tiny little town. Um, they went to a cheese contest in Devon, England, oh, wow. which, you know, is like the center of dairy in the world. Um, and they came home with a blue ribbon. So like we got good cheese here in this tiny little town. Um, so I, yeah, I'm fine with that cheese. It's grass fed. It's local. It's all good. So I yeah. eat that. Um, I eat a little like nuts a little bit now and then because I like the almonds that are like smoke flavored. I got oh, smoke things are so good. Anyway, sometimes a little snack of that, but not a lot because we've got the omega-6 problem. And I'll notice it right away if I've eaten too many. And it's directly my spine is like, this is a very bad pain day. And it's because you've eaten almonds for wow. three days. So just put those away for now. Um, and, you know, I'll eat, I eat some vegetables, um, salads. I, I eat like a salad every day usually because I, I do actually like that. Not everybody does. And I live on the coast. I'm right on the ocean. So we actually have good seafood that comes through here on the regular. Um, and that's very, I just go down to the dock. I can get a lot of good stuff. So I feel really lucky. I live in a rural area. There's lots of good grass-based farms around here. Um, I got my cheese factory. Um, I don't have chickens at the moment, but I want to get them again. So then I'll have my own eggs, but there's lots of great local people who have really good eggs. So that's easy. Um, I'm not a big fruit eater. I've never been a big fruit eater. I don't really understand fruit. I don't crave it. I was whatever on fruit. If I'm going to eat sugar, it's got to be chocolate. So chocolate's definitely, that's my girl. <laughs> it calls my name. You know, like, uh, and I have to be really careful not to bring it into the house because if it's here, I will eat it. It's just, there's no way oh, yeah. around it. Oh, yeah. No, it's gone. Down it goes. So like, just don't even bring it in. Um, yeah. yeah so that's pretty much what I eat. Um, I love that. That's, that's, that sounds very human-like. It's very human. Yes, it. it's the appropriate yeah. human diet. I finally found it and it does work. So Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Well, I won't take any more of your time, but I would love if you would share with the audience how people can find you. I mean, you know, aside from the book, The Vegetarian Myth, which you guys is such a, a read and it's she's written multiple books, but where is the best place for them to find you to learn more about yeah. you? Sure. I have a website and it's real easy because it's learkeith.com. And that's a joke because I have a funny name and you're not going to remember how to spell it. The easiest way to find my website is honestly vegetarian myth. If you type that into Google, you will find my website right away because I'm the only person who wrote a book with that title. It's right there. <laughs> so learkeith.com. Lear is Pierre with an L. So maybe that, you know, you can remember that. But honestly, vegetarian myth is the easiest thing. Yes, I have written other books. Of course, I encourage you all to read my other books too. Um, yeah, but that's, you know, what, what I'm doing. I'm okay. I'm really behind on my website, but theoretically that's where you would go to find out, you know, appearances and podcasts and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully one day I get okay. that updated. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, uh, You're sharing great. your knowledge. My brain is on overload right now. And in such a good way, everything you said was just something I resonated with. And I look forward to looking into your other books and I appreciate you so much for um, sharing your story. Cause I know that probably wasn't an easy thing to share and to not only to take your story, but to be able to help other people yeah. um, along as well that are suffering. Well, that's the goal, right? Yeah. Always. That's what we're here for. <laughs> so we've got to help each other. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for tuning in and uh, we will see you next week. Goodbye. Wow, we've reached the end. But before I leave you, I'd love to hear from you. After all, it's not every day that someone reaches out and asks for your opinion. And to me, your opinion does matter. So please share this episode with anyone that you think needs to hear this message. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. My name is Melissa McAllister. And until next time, thank you for being your own health advocate.